it was you who said it, where you said that women shouldn't fast before exercise. And I had listened to a podcast where they said it was a male talking, saying that you should fast before exercise. So I start <laughs> fasting before exercise, right? Um, and then, you know, Stacey, I see Stacey say the complete opposite. Obviously, you're studying women's bodies, you are a woman, and this is your bread and butter. Tell us why in this instance, that would be different for a male and a female? So it comes down to the brain for the most part. When we're looking at um, some of the control centers of the brain, one of the primary ones is the hypothalamus. So we look at the hypothalamus and this controls our endocrine system. So that's our thyroid, our menstrual cycle hormones, also our appetite hormones. It senses temperature. Um, it senses changes in um, oxygen, partial pressure and pretty much all the environment. And when we're looking at um, the sensitivity of the hypothalamus to nutrition density for women versus men, we see that there are primarily two areas of the hypothalamus that are stimulated through either higher nutrient or lower nutrient density versus one area for men. So when we start getting to the nuts and bolts of what happens when you do fasted exercise, if you're doing fasted training, the hypothalamus is perceiving this as a kind of a, a low energy, high stress state. So if we're thinking about what that then triggers is we see it triggers a perturbation in our appetite hormones where after training, you won't feel hungry, but later on in the day, you'll end up craving and eating more simple carbohydrates and not moving as much. Mm. So when we're looking at the repercussions of that, most people will do fasted training not necessarily for mitochondrial benefit, which is a different um, story all in itself, but most will try to do it as a calorie deficit. They're like, okay, well, I can do fasted training. I can <clears throat> use that as a way to not feel so hungry and I can end up in a calorie deficit. Mm. But we see from the research in women that it does the opposite. You end up eating more and moving less when you do fasted training. And then when we get into the argument of doing fasted training increases our mitochondrial powerhouse, which is the oxygen kind of powerhouse of the cell where all of the fueling mechanisms happen. For men, yes, absolutely. But for women, we're already born by the nature of being XX because we don't have any research outside of that right mm -hmm. now. We are born with more mitochondria better mitochondria density, and more of the proteins that are responsible for mitochondrial um, health, as well as greater metabolic flexibility. So by the nature of being XX, we already have the capability of being metabolically flexible and having really robust mitochondria. So that underlying current and conversation about doing fasting to have better mitochondrial health holds for men, but doesn't hold for women because we already have it. So when we're looking at what happens on top of that, we see this appetite perturbation. It changes our luteinizing hormone and our testosterone pulse, and we end up with a greater intake of the simple carbohydrates and overall moving less. So it, it is kind of a backlash of what we're actually trying to do when people are investing in fasted training. That's so interesting. I would love to know what you think is kind of a good breakfast or something to eat before training. I know for myself, I usually, and I actually do wake up hungry. Like I, I know a lot of people don't, but I do usually, I have my whole life always woken up hungry. Um, and I sometimes have a couple of times a week, like two eggs and avocado. Um, and other times I might have like Greek yogurt and berries and um, like a nut mix kind of thing. And then on the weekends, like I'll have some bread um, as well as eggs and, and stuff. So that's kind of my breakfast. And I feel like, I mean, I don't train every day of the week, but I feel for the days that I train, that's sufficient. I think if I ate more, I might start feeling sick. What do you recommend? There, you're an anomaly as a woman who wakes up hungry. For yeah. the most part, I always hear, well, I'm not hungry till about 11. Part of it Why is, is that? Resp Why are some <laughs> yeah. hungry and some not? <laughs> Yeah, part of it is a learned response because we've had this whole 
sociocultural push on us that we need to be small and dainty and not take up space and we should eat less and exercise more. And it's just a, a reverb that keeps coming up in the fitness world. So when women start to hold off food, then they tend to be disconnected from their appetite. So you don't feel hungry. When we look at uh, actual um, chronobiology type situation, there are differences between a late chronotype and an early chronotype, meaning someone who's a night owl or what do they call it? A morning lark. Mm. Most people who are morning people will wake up hungry and those people who are more night oriented won't necessarily wake up hungry. So there is an undercurrent for that. So if we're looking at women who wake up hungry and have a breakfast like you, that's great. That's fantastic. What you're describing really does fuel well, and you can have that an hour and a half to two hours before training, or even a half an hour before training, depending on how, how well you feel. But for women who don't feel hungry, it doesn't have to be a lot. It could be a couple of tablespoons of Greek yogurt and a little bit of honey. It could be the infamous protein coffee or um, matcha latte that has um, some carb and protein in it. Because we're just looking at around 150-ish calories before you start training with some protein and carbohydrate. Because again, that's going to tell the hypothalamus, you know what, there's some fuel coming in, I can handle the stress. We can actually um, look at this perturbation in our, in our metabolism and we can accommodate for that and we can then adapt for that. Um, yeah. So it doesn't have to be a full meal, yeah. which I think everyone's like, I get up at five o'clock to hit a five thirty class. I can't eat a full yeah, meal. Of like, course. You don't have to. You don't And have you've to. got a um a, a sort of coffee that has become extremely popular. Can you tell us <laughs> a bit about that? What's in it? Um, for those that might want to make it at home. Yeah, I am I laugh hysterically at that because I would get the question of, well, what do you have when you get up so early if you're training at 5.30 or 6 in the morning? I'm like, protein coffee. It's I mix up um, whey protein or pea protein isolate with some almond milk the night before. I add a double shot of espresso, stir it up, put it in the fridge. It's ready to go the next morning. So then I'm getting protein and some carbohydrate and a caffeine boost. Who doesn't like a latte in the morning? Mm. And it's like, okay, good to go. And when it went viral, I was just laughing because there's so many people who are like, what's the scientific rationale behind it? It's like, well, I can tell you the caffeine and the protein part, but they don't necessarily have to be together, but it, it works. It's great. And then what would you eat when you got home after training? Um, I have uh, overnight oats or um, I put in a, a, a nut and seed mix with um, some chia and, uh, Greek yogurt and berries and walnuts. And then I might have a banana or a piece of toast with it, depending on what the session was. Yeah. And I tend to, to not be overly hungry, but I know I need that. And then about 11 or 12 o'clock, I'm like, I really need to eat. So I end up having a bigger lunch than what most people probably would if they're having a breakfast right after their training. Yeah. I find lunch is the thing I struggle with the most because, you know, breakfast, I kind of know what I'm going to eat. Dinner is with the family and I'm by myself for lunch and I'm busy and I'm so don't think ahead, uh, which I probably should when it comes to lunch. So I've got like nothing prepared and some days I can miss it or I'm like, you know, ordering a salad with protein or something and it ends up being a bit clunky. Um, what do you recommend people eat or well, women especially eat for lunch that's going to satisfy them? Because I do find that I get quite hungry and I can feel that my brain kind of starts to get foggy or really starving at around that three, four o'clock when I haven't eaten a good lunch. Yeah. So I'm always telling people reach for protein and fiber whenever they have an eating opportunity. So if you're doing a really good palm and a half size serving of protein with your salad, you're, that's a really great start. Um, and some people who aren't organized and they skip lunch or they're like, I'm just going to grab a smoothie and go. There can be, again, the perception that you don't have enough food and your brain is like, hey, I need more food, which is why a lot of people who don't have stuff in the in the day or adequate food 
will get home before dinner ravenous and mm. then they're eating and then they have dinner and they're still hungry and they're eating after dinner because their body's like, oh, I better store up. So there is a misstep in, in appetite hormone perturbation when you're doing that as well. But I tell women, look, you want to, it's not perfect. You want to reach for some kind of protein and some fiber at every eating opportunity, because that's going to help with blood sugar control. It's going to help with energy. It's going to not make you feel overly full. So yeah, that's I hate that feeling. Thing. Yeah, I hate that feeling. It's too. like, it. it's actually, it's one of the worst feelings when you've eaten too much. I find it, yeah, really like uncomfortable. Yes, exactly. So you could look at having several snacks during the day instead of one big lunch. Um, what sort of things that, would you recommend for snacks? Um, I look in, if you have a refrigerator or capability of having yeah. chilled food, it's always a mixture of fruit and veg, nuts. Um, if you are not plant forward or plant-based, then you can look at hard boiled eggs, uh, some turkey slices or chicken. Yeah. Um, so all of those like really handy, easy to grab things that you might put in your kid's lunchbox, you could also have in your fridge. Mm. Um, make a heads too. You can look at making um, protein bites, which are kind of like bliss balls, but with more protein in it. If you're looking for something that's a bit of a sweet hit and yogurt is always a good one. One of my favorites is cottage cheese and I often will have a, a piece of sprouted grain toast, oh, yeah. with some almond butter and some sliced apple and top it with cottage cheese because then it's like um, almost a gourmet sandwich, but yeah. you're getting a, about 40 grams of protein in something like that. And it doesn't feel overly full and it's it's looks nice on the plate. So lots of and things to play with. When you say um, for lunch, protein and fiber, would that be like a sandwich or um, with some protein in it or a salad with protein in it? What kind of things would you suggest? Whatever fits in your repertoire. So yeah. if you're looking for a sandwich and you're looking at sprouted grain bread with um, protein within it, that's great. If you're someone who's like, I'm not a bread person or I don't like sandwiches or wraps, then go with a Buddha bowl which is pretty much a mix of a whole bunch of different things mm. in a salad bowl. And then you can add some lean protein in because then you know you're getting a wide variety of different proteins as well as fiber. And yes. it's about the aesthetics too. So if it looks nice, then you also feel better about totally. eating it. 